three, two, one, we are live. Dr. B, can you Oof. hear me okay? Yeah, good morning. Uh, talk about uh, <clears throat> learning how to deal with adversity, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Yeah, so good job. Good to go, I believe. I'm just going to make sure that it's popping up here for everybody. And there we are. That's great. Because I would have been really upset if we missed this opportunity um, to, to discuss uh, and have a conversation with, with Lisa Bentley here. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick intro. You're going to do your thing. And then I'm going to get out of the way because I, I ideally I should have gotten some popcorn ready. Um, for this one, because I think Lisa's story is going to be uh, quite, she's going to have quite the story to share. And it's going to be great to learn from her. So a little bit of context on Lisa Bentley here. And actually, before we get to that, welcome everybody to Ask Dr. B Live, where we've got Dr. Aaron Boynton, orthopedic surgeon with an immense, uh, just an amazing career and a, an immense base of knowledge to, to share on injuries, movement, recovery, and being able to get healthy and get moving and keep yourself that way. So any questions that you have in general, feel free to leave them in the chat. Uh, we're here. We're going to be here afterwards to answer any questions that you have. Um, so as they pop up, leave them in and then we'll have them and we can, um, we can address them once we're done the, the main portion of the, of the show. So a little bit of background on for everybody on Lisa Bentley. Lisa Bentley is an 11 time, Ironman champion. So she didn't just participate in Ironmans. She was a champion 11 times. Um, I didn't, I don't know what an iron, I didn't know what an Ironman is and many people might not. So it's basically a triathlon, but a little bit different because you start off with a 2.4 mile swim, which is 3.86 kilometers for my Canadian friends, 112 mile bike, which is 180 kilometers. And then you end it off. The cherry on top is a marathon. You get to run a marathon at the end of that, which is 26 miles, 42 kilometers. Now that in and of itself is amazing. Anybody who does that, kudos, that's crazy. Um, being a kind of sprint type athlete myself. On top of that, Lisa has the genetic condition known as cystic fibrosis. And I'm sure you guys are going to hear about that in more depth, but the quick, the short synopsis of that is it's a genetic disorder that affects mostly the lungs resulting in difficulty breathing, coughing up mucus, and frequent lung infections. So if you can imagine an Ironman or a 10-minute run with cystic fibrosis, then you can appreciate what an Ironman with cystic fi fibrosis might be like. So that's why I'm super excited uh, to get into this. And now I'm just going to turn this over to Dr. B, and then we're going to have Lisa join us in a moment here. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks, Eric. Um, well, welcome back, everybody. Um, over the last couple of weeks, we've reviewed some of the scientific principles that guide us in our understanding of how wear and tear injuries develop, and how we can use these biological mechanisms to direct tissue healing. Our themes don't stop moving, just change how you move, and move enough, but not too much take advantage of science to use movement as medicine. The relax phase is the first part of your recovery from injury. And the goal is to promote tissue uh, healing and pliability. And last week we reviewed some of the physical tools that you can use to achieve this. But there's a very, uh, another very important factor in the relax phase, and that is your mindset and your beliefs about healing. Philosophically, I take a combination of Western scientific and Eastern medical approaches to healing. And I believe that we, uh, we do need science to direct our approach to healing. And at the beginning of my career, I actually grew cells in a Petri dish and, and studied them. And uh, for the last several decades, I've actually worked with the Canadian Orthopedic Foundation. I was the chair of their uh, research committee. So um, I believe in the scientific method, but over my career, uh, talking to people, watching people recovering from adversity and injuries, I was really struck by uh, how um, other, other less traditional or scientific disciplines such as acupuncture, natural remedies, uh, therapies, and the mind 
could influence healing in a very positive manner. And these things are really hard to study, but we're starting to get special scans that allow us to look at brain chemistry. And we're starting to understand the influence of emotions on healing. And my own personal experience has led me to believe that there is a critical component of what, the, of what we as patients will feel uh, and um, their attitudes towards their injury that will determine their outcome. I, I, I could, I've had so many examples of two people with identical physical pathology, but opposite attitudes towards their pain and disability. And one person heals and returns to normal function while the other person remains injured, they never get better and they're, they're disabled. So I've learned that our body has a tremendous healing capacity really an innate intelligence. And that if we leave that innate intelligence alone and just provide the molecules that are necessary for the healing, the body knows how to repair itself. And sometimes we uh, and our actions interfere with this innate process. So it's a concept of trying to make your body do something when it's not ready versus learning to let your body heal. And so this comes back to what we were talking about last week with the rhythm of recovery and learning how to listen to our body and adapt our mindset to optimize healing. And just for a second, imagine throwing a ball. You're going you're to throw it twice. The first time I want you to throw it, I want you to imagine tensing every single muscle in your arm as you're trying to go through the motion. And now the second time, what I want you to do is imagine relaxing your arm as much as you can, make it like a wet noodle and you go through that action of throwing the ball. In the first instance, it's likely gonna feel really challenging and hard to go through that throwing action. You're forcing your body to do something. While the second, when you're more relaxed, you're letting your body do the action and you're trusting it. So often when we're in pain, we're stressed and we tense our muscles. So today's theme is about um, or what I call, you cannot make it happen, you have to let it happen. And it's about learning to use breathing, mindfulness, visualization, and reframing your mindset towards uh, relaxation and healing. And our guest today, Lisa Bentley, knows how to let it happen. She really has a champion's mindset. And I'm so excited for her to join us today and, and share her story and how she's used her attitude to maintain a successful and happy life. So Eric has reviewed um, Lisa's accomplishments. And I have to say that when I met her in 2007, um, I was struck with her, not only her professionalism in how she trained from a physical standpoint, but how, um, how she had such an amazing attitude and how she could take adversity and turn it into um, actually uh, something very positive. And I believe that her attitude is her, one of her biggest weapons in her races. So um, let's welcome Lisa here today to, to join us and talk about dealing with adversity and creating uh, a healing mindset. Hey. Hi, Lisa, can you hear us? Hi, can you? Hi, Lisa. Can you hear us? Hi there. Oh, I can. Welcome. There she is. <laughs> welcome. I'm Thank so, goodness. I guess. Woof. We talked about <laughs> adversity. Oh my God. These technical challenges today have been a <laughs> Woof. But um, how are you doing? I'm good. It's, it's great to see you and connect with you. And uh, yeah, you are a big part of my dream team. Oh, oh. gosh. How many years ago? 2006, seven, eight. <laughs> Yeah, gosh, we're not allowed to talk about how long ago that was. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm just so thrilled to, to see you and connect again. It's um, um, really, really wonderful. Um, so thank you so much. So what have you been doing in this last little while uh, with the COVID lockdown? Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been interesting. And it, once again, sport and the lessons in sport teach you to deal with adversity, which is exactly what this is. 
And uh, just knowing from my own sport background that in every moment when I was living the life of an athlete, whenever I was struck with adversity, there was never a bad conclusion. It was hard and <laughs> there was always adversity. It was always difficult. The injury was never fun, but there was, you know, with the right mindset, you can always come out of adversity and, and reap a lot of great benefits. And I really can't think of one time in my life, one struggle that didn't turn out for the better. So right now during this uh, lockdown, yes, it's difficult. And there's days which are, I'm not going to say days because I won't ever let it get to a whole day of, of sadness or woe is me. But, you know, I have my moments for sure where it's difficult. And I just, you know, I keep thinking this is a, this is a reset on many levels uh, environmentally. I think we can all see the reset that's occurring and the goodness. I think it's a reset for uh, people's behaviors. I think it's a reset for people's diets, <laughs> you know, more eating out. <laughs> I think it's a reset for people to return to exercise that they may have not had time for because of being so busy parenting and working, etc. And, you know, I, I'm really trying to take advantage of this almost as my own reset to, to do some of the things I haven't had time to because I've been on that merry-go-round of I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. And also, you know, I, I just hold on to that idea that from adversity comes success. And uh, so I'm thinking, okay, what's, what's my call? Like, I must have a new calling. And at the end of this, there's going to be something new in my life. And, you know, I pulled out my Tim Ferriss book, Tools of Titans, uh, which I love. And I'm reading these, you know, these stories of these incredible high achievers and thinking, oh, I could do that. <laughs> I could do that. So I basically reinvented myself nonstop throughout this pandemic. But um, yeah, it's hard. We have our two dogs. So we walk a lot. I work a lot, still pretty, very, very busy. I'm exercising. Uh, I miss swimming a lot because uh, that's a, a great, I think we all turn into swimmers eventually uh, as uh, aches and pains uh, get um, co compounded. Uh, I miss seeing my mom. I miss hugging my mom. I miss seeing my friends. No different from anybody else. I, I think the hardest thing is not being able to be helpful. You know, I can't, <clears throat> I can't be helpful. Like I can't, I'm helping my mom bringing her groceries, <clears throat> but I can't go and help a doctor. <laughs> you know, I can't, can't do any of that. And I, it, it feels so difficult to not be able to, to be helpful. So yeah, it's a challenge and I have cystic fibrosis. So that's an underlying worry, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a worrier. So I believe I'm going to be just fine. My husband's far more worried than I am. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I, you know, again, I, I really believe that I'm going to be, I'm going to be just fine. But I always was careful of my hygiene. And when we ever had guests in the house, whenever they left, I would wipe down all the door handles wipe down all the faucets, the bathroom. I, you know, whenever I went to a restaurant, I'd wash my hands after touching the menu. You know, that was, that's been my life because I haven't wanted to catch a cold <laughs> for my life. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to ask you about that because we're all sort of in this situation right now where we are afraid of getting COVID. We're afraid of getting an infection and particularly as we're starting to loosen the lockdown. Uh, you know, I felt very safe kind of in my own little environment. I've created my safe, safe haven, but you know, now I'm gonna start going out more and um, maybe you can help people who are listening to, you know, how you deal with that fear component. And I think you've mentioned a couple of things that you do to take advantage of that, but you know, you live in fear of getting an infection. What can you do so that you can still enjoy your life and go out and enjoy being at a restaurant without mm -hmm. fear of being sick? <clears throat> Yes, I think, you know, as these lockdowns are, are easy, it doesn't necessarily mean we have to go out. And it's not going to be, oh, okay, we're locked down. Okay, tomorrow we're going to a Blue Jay game. That's like, it's not happening. Yeah. And so we don't even have to think about what that's going to be like. Think about the small steps. Think about just going to get groceries. I mean, really, that's not something that I'm doing like I did before. Uh, we are ordering online. We're going to pick it up. And maybe once, actually once every three weeks, I go to Costco because I have a note from my doctor that I get to go with 
um, people that have um, conditions. And I go in there and I'm the first one. And so I'm, I'm minimizing my risks by going when things are less busy. And, and I will continue to do that. So in the old days, mm -hmm. I would go to a grocery store probably every day. Right. I don't know that I'll ever do that again. Like, I don't think I'll ever say, oh, gee, I'm out of broccoli. I think I'll go get a bunch of broccoli. And then the next day say, oh, geez, I'm out of cauliflower. I better go get some cauliflower. I think those days are gone. Like I never used to buy a week's worth of fruit and vegetables ever. And that's mm -hmm. sort of change number one. And, and I think I'll stick with that. It's more efficient anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> if when the gyms reopen, I would probably be the person that's there at five in the morning because I'm going to avoid crowds. Even right now, I walk my dogs three times a day, but my favorite walk is the 6 a.m. walk because I don't see any anybody and I don't have to zigzag down the street, which is what I'm doing now. I did that before, mainly because I didn't want any my dogs to bother people. <laughs> so it's not <laughs> a big deal for me. Right. Um, so I think I'll, I'll do things off hours. I'll limit that. I don't think I'd be afraid to fly. Again, I'm not in that position. It's like someone saying, I'm not afraid to do an Ironman. Meanwhile, it's not on their list. It's on their radar. So it's easy to say, I'm not afraid to do, run a marathon <laughs> when it's not on your radar. I don't feel like I'm going to be afraid to fly. My habits when I flew a year ago were to wipe down my entire seating area, to have hand sanitizer with me. I didn't fly with a mask before, but I will fly with a mask now. So that'll be a new a, a new policy. Uh, the last time I flew was actually March the 4th. Ironically, I was flying back to Toronto to do a speech for Ernst & Young, which was postponed. It didn't oh. happen. <laughs> but I had promised my mom that I was coming home. And so this speech got postponed. And I thought, well, how can I not go see my mom? And I also thought, I think this virus is going to get worse. And if I don't come see her March the 4th, I might not see her for months. And so I actually flew home, but did my normal routine. And I actually, when I got on the plane, I said to my seatmate, you're going to hear me cough. I have cystic fibrosis. <laughs> I'm not sick. Right. <laughs> Please don't worry. <laughs> and it was interesting because the couple of days before I flew, I was really quite um, congested. And I thought I have to take some antibiotics <laughs> because the entire plane's going to vacate when I get on. <laughs> and I was fine. I didn't cough once. But anyway, I came home. So I, I don't see that changing. But again, I, I don't touch a railing without washing my hands. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what I plan to continue to do. Okay, well, that's excellent. So it sounds like a lot of good hygiene, limiting mm -hmm. your exposure. And uh, if you have been exposed in some way or another that uh, you know, you've touched a menu, then you're gonna go wash your hands again. So it's using a lot Absolutely. of common sense. Yes, well, I, mean, awesome. I, probably, I probably wouldn't take public transit. So I had planned to go to the CF clinic, which is at St. Mike's Hospital, uh, the beginning of May to get, you know, sort of my every three months, I had a checkup to see how my lungs are. And I'm pretty sure that's postponed. <laughs> but if I get to have an appointment, say in um, June or July, I would normally have taken the go train or public transit, there's no way I'll be doing that. Like, I'm just not going to put myself into positions of risk, I would drive down and park and, and go to the doctor. Okay, well, that sounds smart. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's important you do take good care of yourself that way. <laughs> Um, okay, well, on a slightly different uh, note, um, like I've loved your book, uh, mm -hmm. An Unlikely Champion. It's here if, uh, if for everybody to see. And um, you've got so much, so much great information and so many inspiring stories in here. But I think one of my favorites is uh, your chapter five, uh, A Champion's Mindset and Finding Success Despite Adversity. And, uh, you know, having an injury is a, an, an adverse event. And Maybe you can talk a bit about the lessons that you learned from that experience with your coach uh, in dealing with adversity and then how you've applied that to your injuries over, the, over your career. I, I suppose what I evolved into realizing was that there's a reason for everything. And once I adopted that sort of mindset, I was always trying to find the reason behind an injury. And I... I do like to be in control, but I also learned somehow to give up control, control what you can control. Mm -hmm. And so when I was faced with an injury, 
I would say, okay, what can I do? Forget about what you can't do. <laughs> Someone else will tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Figure out what you can do. And so in most cases, mine were running injuries. And so running was usually off the, off the table. And so I would, you know, exploit those things that I now could do, which was swimming and cycling and strength training and mindset, which is a really important piece of the puzzle. And, and so I, you know, my swimming was, my running was my strength. So it was a great thing to get injured, really. Like, thank God my, my running was injured, not my swimming, because that would have been terrible. And so I would stop running. And, you know, you were part of my dream team. And I also had great physiotherapist, Steve Hill and Dr. Gallia and Mark Scapatici. And, uh, and Steve Hill was my physiotherapist since 1996. And he would, you know, a couple of things stood out. He'd say, you know, if you go for that run, do you have more to gain or to lose? Mm -hmm. You know, when you're, when you're running mile 23 of the marathon, do you think that run is going to get you to the finish line faster or will that run take away from you getting to the finish line? More often than not, I had more to lose by doing that run. So it was like, okay, I'm going to skip that run because I have more to lose. So that was one thing that stood out in my mind. And uh, the other thing that stood out in my mind was fit versus healthy. So I can be 100% fit, but if I'm only 80% healthy, then I'm not going to perform up to my capability. And so my goal as I got more intelligent about racing was maybe to be a little bit less fit, but be 100% healthy. And, and my experience from racing endurance sport is that if you get onto that start line and there's even 1% <laughs> doubt or one percent something sore you're going to that one percent when the times get tough when when you're in a moment of adversity and, and we can all put ourselves there when you're at a dark moment and if somebody says to you a statement you can you'll interpret that the worst way possible if you're in a dark moment even though there might be no harm meant meant by that statement we've all been in that position where we fly off the handle same thing when you're at mile 23 in a marathon after nine hours of racing and, and something's going wrong, you're going to say, I shouldn't be here. My foot is sore. This is brutal. If you're winning the race, nothing hurts. Trust me. Everything's amazing. <laughs> but when there's adversity, everything hurts. So you can't have that, that injury at all. So I just learned very early on that, you know, I'm better not to run if I'm injured. There was never testing it. You know, I never, a lot of, people say, Oh, just see how it is. I I'm rather on or off, shut it down. Like if I can't run the way I like want to run then shut me down. And so that's sort of <clears throat> what I adopted. And then I tried to exploit my weaknesses, which was swimming and biking. So I remember swimming, you know, 30 K a week, which is a lot of swimming. So I swam every single day and I swam with the swim team. I swam with kids. They were 10 years old and they were way. And just try to get faster and faster. And then I was biking a ton and, and getting stronger and stronger on my bike. So I didn't miss running because I was exhausted from swimming and biking. And I implemented water running, which helped. It made me feel like I was running. I was doing my strength training and trying to get the weakness better. So, you know, my Achilles was always my Achilles heel. That was my injury. Mm -hmm. And so I was working, you know, you, you actually were very, um, instrumental in teaching me to address the area above and below so it was about making my foot stronger and making my calf looser but also stronger so let's get the the two opposite spots as as healthy as they could be so with physio I was working on those areas and getting strong so that when everything came together I was going to be the strongest best athlete on that start line and then just also envisioning myself getting better and again, those were words that you said to me when my Achilles was healing and I was laying in a hyperbaric chamber for a total of 60 hours. It was one and a half hours uh, for multiple days. And I'd be laying there and you would tell me to envision my Achilles healing. The little tiny cells, envision them all knitting together into a beautiful little network and getting strong. And, you know, that was all part of my arsenal. So when I finally got to race, and I got on that start line, really, there was nothing I would rather have done. And I said that to myself, like, I'm waking up today, it's race day. I'm doing Ironman Canada. It's a marathon mm -hmm. <laughs> at the end of 180k bike ride and a four, a four kilometer swim. 
my longest run is 21 kilometers. I'm doing a marathon and my longest run is 21 kilometers. I'm only running three days a week after years of running seven days a week. Like I used to run 100 kilometer weeks. Now I'm maybe running 35, 40 because that's what would keep me healthy. It wasn't going to make me super fit, but it was going to make me healthy. And my Achilles wouldn't have survived any more than that. So I woke up that day, Ironman Canada, and I remember my husband saying, do you think you can run a marathon? I'm like, I don't know. I haven't run longer than 90 minutes in like six months. And that's after two months, no running. But <clears throat> as I said, there was nothing I would rather do on that day. And when it was hard and it got hard, I just kept remembering all the work that went into that Achilles. It wasn't miles on the road. It was treatments with, with yourself. It was physiotherapy. It was acupuncture with Dr. Scapatici. It was seeing Dr. Gallia. It was visualization. It was swimming. It was biking. All of that was on that day. And my race day became a celebration of all that hard work. So I couldn't fail. Like there was no way I could fail just by being on that start line was a success. And the great thing was, is I got to the finish line and I had a, you know, a really good race. I ended up, you know, I, I, I didn't have my very best marathon, but I ended up winning the race, which is really not important. What was important was that I got to the finish line and I was so, so happy. Um, you know, we made modifications. I changed the shoes I was wearing. We did things, you know, with you, with you and my group, um, we found a way to win. And that's, mm -hmm. that's what it's about. And we can't win in the orthodox way. We can't win by running 100 kilometer weeks anymore. So we got to use your experience, your mind, your mindset. Um, and you, we've got to outthink everybody else. That's what we have to do when we're on that start line and, and exploit their weaknesses. So um, that's, um, you know, and I couldn't do that by myself. Like I said at the beginning, you were part of my dream team. And I think everybody have you on this one, okay? Everybody needs a dream team. This is a and we one. just have to find it. And right now in this time of adversity, we all really need our dream team. Oh, that's, that's excellent. Um, so you mentioned that you, uh, you use visualization. Um, are there any other things that you use? Uh, I think you talk about journaling and, and, you know, sort of when you've got this attitude, like what if you're somebody, and I know that myself, I was always really hard on myself, like, oh, you know, and hard on my body if I'm injured. Like, it's like, oh, God, I want this to be better now. And I want to, I want to make it be better. And um, were there any tools that you used um, to help you with changing your attitude and creating that champion's mindset? One of my favorite things to do and to suggest to people is to create an asset list and mm -hmm. really just sit down and write down everything you've got going for you. And this is invaluable <laughs> because, you know, all of us at different times feel like we've got nothing going for us. And the things that I would put on my asset list would be things like, I'm educated, I'm loved, I'm empathetic, I can listen to people, I have two dogs, I have a great mom, I have great friends, uh, I work hard, I never quit, I'm a problem solver, I will find a way where there is no way. You know, and, and it takes time, you've got to sit down and think about it. And and nothing is irrelevant on it. So tell, sit down and say, I'm going to write down 30 things that I've got going for me. And it can be the fact that you cleaned out a drawer. Like that means you're organized. You know, these are things that are good about you. And when you look at that list, you're going to realize that you've got more going for you than you ever thought. And I would do that before every single race. And, and I would add to that list just because it was about racing and about performance. I would write down my best workouts. I'd write down uh, my best races and call upon that. So that would, you know, arm me up. That would give me my armor to take into the event. So when things were getting difficult, I would be reminded of the fact, you know, of, of, of a great workout or a moment where, you know, I remember this one workout I did and it was so cold. It was, I was training through a Canadian winter and I had to run two and a half hours and I'm running into a headwind and there's snow coming towards me and I'm freezing and I'm cold. And, you know, 
in my moment of weakness, I'm thinking, my coach doesn't get it. He lives in Victoria. He thinks every day's utopia and it's 10 Celsius and I'm running in minus 10 and he doesn't understand it. And like, these are all the negative, this is the vortex that we get into and it's not fair. And, and it's like, no, 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 no. That was, that's not a champion's mindset. The champion's mindset is this is going to make me so strong. I am so tough. My competition isn't doing this. And it's interesting as I matured, I started to realize, oh, running in the cold, that's kind of like high altitude training because I can't breathe as well. So this is like, you know, in the wind, like this is so hard. And, you know, that became my ammunition. So when I'm racing and I think, God, this is so hard. I think back to, well, you're not running uphill, up north into the snow and hail and freezing. You're, you're, in an opportunity you get to race <laughs> you're here with this great competition you're so lucky and we have opportunities and we have to change our perspective sometimes to say instead of woe is me this is so hard for me change the change the uh the way we look at it into opportunity and, and that's why i say right now this as this horrible time <laughs> of whether it be injury or pandemic it, it is an opportunity like how how good can we be at the end of May? How, how good can, what, what can we come back in June? Can we come back in June better than we were on May 1st and, and use that as an opportunity? Well, I, I think that's an excellent uh, uh, way of looking at things. Like I know for myself personally, I mean, I really got down the rabbit hole at the beginning of this. Like um, you know, I'm not in a hospital, so I'm not out treating people on the front line. And as an orthopedic surgeon, um, you know, they, they aren't calling upon us because we're not COVID experts. But, you know, I had sent my information into um, Ontario Health because I wanted to do virtual assessments and help with this whole problem. And so you mentioned at the beginning of the of the show about kind of feeling helpless. Well, I felt helpless in my ability to be a doctor. And, you know, I'd been through the SARS uh, epidemic. And, and so I kind of knew what needed to be done. But that was something I couldn't control because they didn't need me. Unfortunately, they haven't needed me, which is good news. Um, wasn't able to play tennis, was supposed to be going and playing in the world championships. Uh, you know, they were not making money, you know, all these things that are just kind of like stressful. Mm -hmm. And um, finally, I was able to kind of come out of the rabbit hole and, and reframe. Mm -hmm. And so I've been finishing a book. I've been starting this show with Eric. Um, and I've been working really hard on my foundation for movement so that when I get back out on the tennis court, I'm going to be faster and I'm going to be stronger. And my movement longevity is going to be longer. You know, that's like, you know, we have some amazing women that are out playing tennis. Rita Price is one I think of. She's like 90. I don't, I'm not sure if she's 92. 90. She's just like, she's, but she's amazing. And she was, she's a dancer and you should see her dance around the court and her, she's vivacious. And I think, gosh, I'm going to be Rita Price out there. I want to be, you know, hundred and whatever out on the tennis court. So it is, it's, it's learning to, to take the difficult times and to reframe. Um, and I think writing things down is a great tool that you're talking about because when you're just thinking so often the mind gets interrupted by the negative thoughts and the negativity, but if you can write it down, you're using another sense. You're not only using the mind, but you're able to, you know, you're feeling the pen, you're looking at your, your writing and you can even read it to yourself so that you can use more of the senses. So it really becomes part of who you are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that's, well, that's really exciting. Um, I'm wondering, Eric, if you have any questions that you might like to ask uh, Lisa, or if we have, you know, questions from the audience, if, if they would like to um, join in. Yeah, yeah, I'll make my appearance again into the video. Um, I think everything you're saying is, is pretty amazing. And I'm definitely going to take a look at that and grab your book um, because I think it, right now, especially like Dr. B, you know, I have my ups and downs with the, with the whole pandemic and being locked down and having the routine and the things that I, I like doing um, being impacted. Um, but back to the more of the training side of things and the rehab side of things. One question I'm curious about is um, like when I first met Dr. B and I was just amazed at how different her approach was compared to other orthopedic surgeons I've talked to. Like most orthopedic surgeons don't really consider, at least the ones that I've talked to in the past, didn't really consider movement. Uh, really, it's more, are you a candidate for surgery or not? No, then okay, go, you know, work with your physiotherapist or whoever you're working with. 
um, if you do need surgery or if I recommend surgery, then we'll talk. Um, so was there any differences in, in Dr. B's approach to that you found, and I'm guessing you've had the other orthopedic surgeons that you've consulted with in the past? Oh, absolutely. Unequivocally, <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Boynton is, uh, yeah, it was an angel for me. And we connected on a great level, as you can even tell from our dialogue. And uh, for an orthopedic surgeon not wanting, not wanting to do surgery on you, <laughs> it's, I think that's the first, that's the first uh, accolade, uh, that they're actually looking at the, the whole person. And I don't even think we ever really talked about surgery, to be honest, about my Achilles. And my Achilles was, was pretty bad. It was a, a two-year rehab. And, uh, but the, the attention to the, to the detail. So um, I think it's really important that you find a practitioner that doesn't think they have all the answers. The practitioner says, I'm going to do my share, but you also need to go to your physiotherapist to do X and you need to go to your chiropractor and do Y and you need to go to your sports doctor and do Z. Not, there's not one size fits all here. And I, I think it's a real error for anyone to think that one practitioner has all of the answers. And so when I saw uh, Dr. Aaron, um, she took care of it from a medical point of view, but she wanted me to go see Dr. Scapatici so that he could loosen up the calf. So she was doing her part on the Achilles, but now she needed him to work on, you know, freeing up the, the, the calf so that now it could sort of work with this Achilles that she'd been working so hard on. And then she needed me to go for physio so that I could, you know, start doing the work on it, the eccentric loading to now get it stronger. And, and so everybody was working together and that was so important. And at the same time, I'm saying to uh, Dr. Boynton, you know, I really want to race, you know, Subaru Ironman Canada. I haven't run for April, May, and June. I just started to walk run. And, you know, now we're into like late July. And she says, you know, I, if you really want to do this, I really think you should do this. This wasn't taking into account an MRI. <laughs> this was taking into account my heart, my desire. And that's a, you know, that's a special clinician <laughs> that does that. You know, she realized that I was, you know, you can't take the heart out of the athlete. You can rip their Achilles to shreds, but you can't, <laughs> you can't, you know, you hold somebody down. And she saw that I probably could elevate my game to a level that was going to make up for a less than ideal Achilles tendon and a less than ideal level of fitness and preparedness on the athletic front. And so that was a real holistic approach that I, I uh, could use. And you don't need someone to tell you what you can't do. You need someone that can tell you what you can do. And not once during our dialogue, do we talk about winning the race? I wasn't going there to try to win. I was going there as my reward for basically for sitting in a hyperbaric chamber for 60 hours, for getting poked and prodded and needled and, and, and for being in agony and for driving downtown from, for, you know, to see her and going from appointment to appointment for six hours of day of rehab, basically, if you added it all together, my reward was to go race as hard as I could for nine hours <laughs> where I didn't have to phone a doctor or make an appointment. I just <laughs> wanted to go and let loose. And so it was my reward. I didn't really care how I finished. I just needed, I just needed sort of the, you know, the birthday cake at the end of this and, and to have a purpose. We all need a goal. We all need a purpose. And so once um, Dr. Aaron said, you know, yeah, I think you can do it. Like, I think you've been making progress. I think you can do it. Now I had a goal. Now I could jump out of bed. Now I, every time I went and saw her or my physio or Dr. Scapatici, it was like, okay, I'm one step closer to getting stronger and the visualization became stronger and, and everything, all my energy. And that's what we all need is a goal. And, and so, you know, if you're, if you're listening to this right now and you feel a little bit lost, like come up with a goal, a little goal. It doesn't have to be an Ironman. It certainly don't make it a, you know, it doesn't have to be anything like that. Just something different than today. Just make a tiny little goal. And, uh, and that's where, you know, 
Dr. Aaron helped me a lot. That's the holistic approach. That's what you need when you're seeking out a clinician, someone that looks at you and cares about you. And, and that's not taught at medical school or physio school. That's something that's inside their heart. And uh, that, that's my wish for every clinician. <laughs> and I've been lucky that I found some, some really good ones. Well, I mean, thank you so much for that, Lisa. I really appreciate those words. Um, and I really think you're so correct in, in trying to get a goal. You know, when you're injured and you can't do the things that you really, really love to do, um, setting little goals, mini goals, so that you don't feel like you're in rehab all the time, but you're actually doing something and you're being productive, moving towards that goal. And the, the goal might be, you know, walking up a set of stairs pain-free or walking a block or, but then that you can build upon that. And it gives you a good feeling because you've achieved something in your, in your recovery and in your healing. So I love that, that you've said that mm -hmm. to set a goal. Yeah, I'd like to uh, ask a little bit about um, what motivated you first to get into Ironmans, because that is, you know, if you go back to cystic fibrosis, that's not the typical path that people take who have that. It's like, you know, lung issues, breathing issues, you're not going out and running a nine hour race. Um, and that just seems to me to be like the complete opposite of what one might kind of strive towards uh, <laughs> with that condition. So I'm really curious about what motivated you at the beginning and if and how that changed throughout your career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, early on, I mean, I was a runner and in high school and then I went to university and I met some friends and uh, we started doing triathlon and it was around that time that I actually got diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis is genetic and and many, if not most nowadays are diagnosed as infants. I wasn't diagnosed as an infant. I was sick as a kid, really sick, but no one knew why. So there'd be many times I was coughing up blood and um, you know, it was just allergies. Like, oh, you've got a very allergic child. And I remember going to the allergist and him saying, you know, you guys should really move to Arizona or something. Like this isn't a good climate for you. You know, your daughter's sick. She's on antibiotics for nine months of the year. But the challenge was, is the doctors didn't know, uh, you know, oh, you've got, you're sick. You have a chest infection. We'll give you erythromycin. Well, you know, for CF, erythromycin isn't the drug of choice because you're probably have pseudomonas or a particular bacteria that's particular to cystic fibrosis. And so for, you know, the first 20 years of my life, we weren't targeting the right bacteria. So basically for the first you know, 20 years, I just was me and just did stuff. So now I'm in university and I'm starting to do triathlon. And now I find out I have cystic fibrosis, mainly because my sister was diagnosed. She had been sick and coughing up blood quite a bit. And they tested her for everything, tuberculosis, cancer, everything. And then they said, oh, we're just going to do a sweat chloride test. And it turned out it was positive. And they tested the kids and the family <clears throat> and three, <coughs> excuse me, three out of four of us tested positive for CF. And so then that, you know, for me, I didn't say to myself, Oh, my gosh, I'm so sick. I've got CF. I said, fantastic. <laughs> I get to get the drugs I need. Like, I'm not going to be sick all year anymore. I'm so happy. And, but you know, also, I was a university. So you know, I, I was indestructible. So I just continued on my merry way, love triathlon, love what it did for me. Yeah, I got sick, but I'd get on antibiotics. And um, you know, there was, you know, lots of sickness in there. I went to Pan American Games, which was short course. So that was before I did Ironman. That was 1.5 kilometer swim, 40k bike, 10k run. And I made the Pan American Games team. And I was so sick before that race. That was a big turning point in my CF world. Uh, and I couldn't run around one lap around New York University track without just coughing and stopping. And, and that was when the doctors put me on some big antibiotics and that's sort of when my days of Ventolin and Palmacourt inhaled antibiotics started. I haven't been off them since then. Um, so was doing short course, short course triathlon changed a bit when it got to be an Olympic sport and it favored a great swimmer and I was not one of the best swimmers. And someone said, oh, you should, you know, try a long distance race. I think that would be great for you. You love exercising like for hours. And I thought, oh, fantastic. I guess I exercise all day long. <laughs> I'm going to do this. And so I went to my first race in Japan. And um, at the time, my coach didn't know, didn't think it was as long as it was. 
and it was a um, three kilometer swim, 150 kilometer bike ride, and then a marathon. And I remember a week before the race, my longest ride was three hours. My longest run was an hour and a half. And he said, oh, I didn't realize it was a marathon. Oh, well, go have a good race to your best. And I raced and, you know, I ended up having a great race. And I thought, this is really fun. Like, it's a long day. I get to problem solve. So much can happen. And I just got really addicted to it. And um, I mean, the challenge with Ironman is it is such a stress on the immune system. So there's, there's, first of all, there's no question that exercise has helped me as a person with CF. Absolutely no question. All the doctors know it. In fact, when I retired from sport, my CF doctor said, we expect your lung function to go down because you're not going to be working out as hard. I saw that as a challenge. It's like, oh. It will not. <laughs> I promise you, I'm going to keep going hard Every, at least three days a week. I'll try to do something very hard. Um, but, you know, they realize that exercise has helped to clear the mucus out of my lungs. And um, so exercise is great for someone with CF, to, according to their capability, of course. And but the challenge with Ironman is it's so much training. It really uh, hurts your immune system. Like you're riding the edge. I can remember many times. I do an amazing, you know, have an amazing workout, ride my bike for five hours hard, run for two hours hard. And I just feel like on top of the world, like oh, I'm going to win the world championships. I'm going to do it all. And the next day I'd be like flat on my back, sick with a chest infection. Like it's just that razor thin edge between super, super fit and really, really sick. So I, I balanced that a lot when I was racing. So that was, that's a challenge, it was a challenge for sure. So I was definitely on antibiotics a lot, probably about three times a year for three to four weeks each time. And, uh, but you know, I got used to it. Like I, like I've never been used to being a hundred percent healthy. Uh, being on antibiotics certainly led to some of my Achilles issues because ciprofloxin uh, does cause Achilles tendon uh, damage. <laughs> so that's probably why I've got some nasty Achilles. And I was on ciprofloxin probably three times a year, uh, probably a total of three, three months at a, t a, a year. So there's no question that added to it. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I mean, with, when I got sick, you know, I would say my health is not as good as it used to be, my CF health. Uh, 2010, I got quite unwell uh, with my lung function dropping to about 55%. It's now come back up, which is wonderful. Um, but, um, you know, I just marvel at my doctors. Again, very much like, uh, Dr. Aaron in that it's a holistic approach. They've never told me I can't do anything ever. And they've never treated me different from anyone else. Like the person in the room next to me could be going in for a lung transplant, which is like very serious. And they'll come into my room and I'll say, oh, you know, I'm feeling really good. Like you don't have to worry about me. And they're like, no, no, no. Like your lung functions down by, you know, 10%. It's 83% or something like that, which is like not, not great, but it's amazing. <laughs> like it's not 30% and they'll spend just as much time with me as with anybody else. Like they're just so good. And, um, you know, there was one time probably five years ago where I had a collapsed lung and again, it's a shout out to exercise. I only knew I had a collapsed lung cause I was swimming and I was thinking, wow, I'm really gotten slow. And my arms really sore. Like I, I really feel out of breath and my arms sore and like, it just felt weird. I wasn't breathing well. And I went to my family doctor and um, which again, I'm not a, a run to the doctor kind of person. And he said, I, I'm just going to send you for um, an x-ray of your lungs and see what's going on. And then, you know, I get the phone call, which, you know, you know, again, you don't typically get the doctor phone call <laughs> at five o'clock at night. <clears throat> and he said, can you go get a CAT scan? And he says, it's probably just a shadow. And then off I went to get a CAT scan. And sure enough, I had a collapsed lung. And, um, you know, call, you know, the CF clinic uh, said, you know, it's likely a mucus plug. It's not more than that. And their remedy wasn't, uh, you know, coming right now for a procedure. It was tomorrow, if you can run really, really hard and bike really hard, you might cough it out. So let's try like a week of antibiotics to loosen it up. And then we want you to go out and run really hard and try to really cough. 
and get on your nebulizer and, and do inhaled therapies and cough this out and call us in a couple of days. And I call them a few days later and say, oh yeah, I'm feeling way better. And so in I went for a CAT scan again. And they're like, no, you're just getting used to it. <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> and so sure enough, I had to go in and get it taken out. But you know, that again, that's the holistic approach. It's not, oh, okay, well, let's charge you up with a bunch of antibiotics and do a procedure. Let's get you to try to cough this out naturally, uh, which, you know, I, I really appreciated the effort, but it didn't work. <laughs> That's, that's, I can imagine uh, having, uh, swimming with a collapsed lung, um, <laughs> mainly because I'm kind of like a, I'm flailing around and, you know, one lap, I'm pretty much at my max heart rate in the pool, uh, which makes a good exercise for me. But, um, so as, as you're going through, uh, like your career and you're encountering all these issues, was, was it kind of what we're seeing right here, which is just um, not just to diminish it, but reframing, constant reframing, constant, okay, what is the possibility out of this? What is the opportunity of, out of this? Uh, was that your attitude basically with all the obstacles and issues that you ran up against? Absolutely. And, and that was an evolution. I mean, I, I didn't feel like that at age 20. I <clears throat> didn't feel like that probably even at age 30. I, you know, certainly didn't <clears throat> like the fact that I had CF, <clears throat> but, um, and didn't want anyone to know, didn't want it to be a crutch. But I mean, I, I think I evolved into the feeling of, I, I want to be happy. And there's lots of times that I'm not, don't get me wrong. I, you know, Monday was a tough day for me. I felt just kind of a bit plateau, a bit gray. And I just knew I needed another day. I know my triggers. But my, my real goal is to be happy. And so if something's not making me happy, I need to change it so it makes me happy. I just, it's just the way that I want to be because that's, it, it just has to be that way. We make our choices and it doesn't mean we don't have bad days, but I, so when, when things were negative, I, I just, I, I really just believe we need to reframe them, rework them so that we make it into being something good. And that episode may not be good. This pandemic is not good. People dying of this virus is not good. Cannot reframe that. But my little world, I will try to reframe it. In my little world, I'll try to make goodness come out of being, having to stay at home. And I will not, I don't want this to end and say, gosh, I wasted my time. And I could have done x y or z i could have become better and i i really think that we all you know we don't have to be great we just have to be better than we were yesterday in whatever way that is whether it be accepting something it, it just make today better than yesterday in the tiniest 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 little way and um and and how can we do that and and we can't all think of the ways. So that's the great thing right now about um, meetings like this is that maybe someone listening has taken away a tiny little tidbit and they're gonna take that into their day. So this is a great opportunity for people to listen to podcasts or go onto YouTube and, and learn something new or you know, you've always wanted to do plant-based eating but never had the time you know this is the time to go onto a website and learn how to do it and you might not do it completely maybe you do it one day a week who knows like again just come away and finish today a bit better than you were yesterday with that little tiny nugget of information or strategy you know maybe you're going to start a journal today like this is incredible. Can you imagine reading your journal five years from now <laughs> or people that are homeschooling their kids? Your kids, I hope they're all writing journals right now because this is an incredible part of their life that they, that they need to remember in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Uh, I mean, one of the most interesting things, my mom's 86 and she's moving and she's cleaning things out. And there was, uh, she had this, uh, it was my project. I was, I think 13 years old. And it said all about me, <laughs> which is <laughs> hilarious <laughs> to look at. And anyway, it was a hundred points that I wrote as a 13 year old, all about me. And now I've just seen it. And it was hilarious to look at. And so many of the things are exactly the same. I'm like, oh my goodness. 
but you know, what a fun project for parents that are homeschooling their kids to do right now. But I mean, I just think picking up a pen and paper right now, and if it's not every day, it doesn't matter, but, and then revisit this in five years, like, let's see if we, where we've come. Uh, but every, we don't get this day back again. Everything is an opportunity if we can reframe it into an opportunity. And I, I promise, I really do promise that we're going to come out of this, you know, better in some way, even in the worst circumstances, I think we're going to come out better. Right on. Um, I just want to follow up maybe for somebody who's watching and might feel like that the reframing might have challenges reframing. Um, it's the mental block to doing that. Uh, whether it's feeling like they're dismissing their own emotions about something. Um, was there something that, because it, it's clear that your power and your skill in this, and that's kind of how I frame it as it's a skill, like being able to reframe something as a skill. Was there something that's helped you develop that skill? Is it just, is it practice? Is it maybe a, a, a distinction in the way that you think about it? Um, what has led to your, clear a mastery in this area well i think it's life experiences to be honest like i i, I really think <clears throat> it as horrific as it was to go through a separation and a divorce in 2003 and trust me it was horrific i cried and i cried and i didn't sleep probably for about four months and uh it was the hardest thing i ever went through but it came out all right you know, I, I came out way stronger and I learned so much about myself. And I think that was a huge turning point in my life to realize that goodness comes from things. So I, I really think it takes life experiences for us to learn that skill, but also writing things, you know, writing things down is huge. Like I'll write myself letters all the time about episodes and I'll, I'll find them years later. So I you know put them away and then I, I read about it and I, and, and I, sometimes get upset at myself I'm like you haven't changed <laughs> like you were upset about that three years ago what are you doing you need to stop you need to change and um you know I one of my I would say character flaws is I am so um, much into routine very much driven I'm, I'm, I'm overdriven and I'm very routine oriented and I always push myself hard I don't let myself off the hook and so, you know, I'm these last eight weeks, I mean, we're caught like we're I wish I could uh, say to my husband, I wish I wasn't me today. Like, I wish I could escape me. I don't want to. I don't want to go on the rowing machine. I don't want to ride my bike inside again. Like, I don't want to. But I can't not because it's me and I it's my habit. So I'm habitual and it's um, not hurting me. I'm not jeopardizing anything. I can talk myself in and out of everything, but I realize that's my flaw. And so it's interesting. Sometimes I'll cut my ride short and, and I'll say, I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> cut my ride short. And my husband's like, Are you <laughs> like, this is huge for me to get off my bike 10 minutes early. Are you kidding? This is a huge success. So it's almost, um, I can admit that like sometimes I want to get out of myself I want to get out of my skin and if I don't write it down like I write it down as my little story to myself and I realize you know can I do this a little bit better tomorrow can I be a bit kinder to myself tomorrow and that's sort of the routine I get into even with myself and things and, and you know it was interesting and it might be a good little uh, um something to do for people is I wrote a letter that of how I wanted to be remembered when I'm not alive anymore. And it was really, it was really like emotional to write that letter. And it's like, what do I want? The, what do I want the people in my circle to, to say about me? And it's not, it's not meant to be egotistical. It's, you know, like some people say, Oh, I want, them to think I'm the fastest person in the world you know for me it was I want people to think that I was kind or you know whatever it is I I won't talk about what those things are but you know and then I look at that letter and I ask myself am I that person 
and that's you know what I strive for. And and so I really think that right now is a, is a great time for self reflection and in adversity, whether it be injury or currently in this pandemic or wherever you are in your life, where there's might be a little bit of a struggle, life is a test of character and integrity. So when we're pushed in our life, we have to remember that. So, you know, your actions, are you preserving your character and your integrity in your actions? And if you are, then act. But if you're not, then scale back and see what you need to be doing differently. But write that letter of how you wanna be remembered one day and, and let that guide your actions that you know right now we can we can control a lot of our actions right now because it's really just us in our little bubbles <laughs> well that lisa i love that and I, I think one thing that i hear coming out of your discussion is uh about yourself is how accepting you are of who you are at this moment and maybe recognizing okay where i want to be and how every day you can change that and so you know if somebody's really angry or if somebody's really feeling emotions that we may view as not good emotions, I think it's important that we acknowledge them and we don't stuff them away and put them away that, but we actually put them on the paper and we read about them so that we can say, okay, well, that isn't maybe who I wanna be or what I wanna feel, but I do feel that. And now what are the choices that I can make to work with that emotion and work with that feeling so that it becomes part of me and it, it helps to change who I am going to be tomorrow or today, you know, in another minute. Um, because I think that when we try to hide things from ourselves, that they rear their ugly heads in moments of adversity. And, but when you've managed to bring that part of yourself into your being and accepted it and actually been grateful for it. I mean, I, I hear so much acceptance and gratitude in your outlook um, so that's maybe just something to think of for people to think about as well, that don't feel badly if you have certain thoughts yeah. or feelings, <laughs> write them down, but then but what can you do to evolve that for yourself? Yeah, yeah I've, I've taken a lot out of what you've been sharing here, Lisa. So thank you so much for, for what you've been saying and, and sharing with us today so far. Um, and just what you just said there, uh, was just like a, a kind of a trigger for me just now and today is today I, I kind of quote unquote wrote, woke up on the wrong side of the bed essentially um, so I can and I, that's not who I want to be and having that reminder of who you want to be as kind of the guiding post and moving towards that and when you're whenever you deviate go back to that. It's the principle, as you mentioned, you know, character, integrity, um, those character traits and values that, that you hold for yourself. Um, so thank you for, for, for that and sharing that. That's very helpful for me in this moment and overall. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Well, I know it's now 10 after one, Lisa, thank you so much for your time. And I, <laughs> I don't, pleasure. you know, um, I, I'm sorry that we didn't give people a chance to ask you questions because we, uh, Eric and I became the hogs here, but um, <laughs> um, I, I'm so grateful for you spending time with us today. Uh, and it's been so nice to connect with you and see your smile. Your smile <laughs> is something that, uh, geez, I, I, I'll never forget. And um, you've really shared some inspirational words uh, for everybody who listens. And, and I, I've got some things I'm going to go and I'm going to write down right after this. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so, so thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm very grateful. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks everybody for listening. It's, uh, it's been awesome to share. Thank you, Lisa. All right, everybody. Well, that wraps another episode of Ask Dr. B. And hopefully you can join us again next Thursday at noon. So take care. We'll see y'all soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.